morning. Good to see you. Here we are for our uh, service of morning prayer today, this uh, last Sunday in January. So next Sunday, all doing well, we're going to gather for our Holy Communion, and we look forward to that. That'll be here, God willing, at uh, 12 o'clock next Sunday. If, uh, if you weren't around last week, then you might have missed that there is a kind of, there are some, some changes with the COVID-19 restrictions. So we are back to singing again. So we're really pleased about that. So we will be having our hymns and we can join in. We still have our face masks at the minute and we still have people spread out a bit, which is um, for the time being. But we'll keep an eye on that and those things might change before too long, we hope as well. We also hope to get our Sunday school going again um, soon. So that is being worked on uh, at this moment, and uh, it will get announced. So we hope that we're going to be back to having Sunday school um, in a matter of a few weeks' time from now. So listen out for details of that whole thing. Well, we're going to turn to uh, our hearts heavenwards in our worship and in our praise. Now we're going to come to our first hymn. The number, if you want to say it in the book, is 634, but it will also be up on the screen. Thanks to our dedicated helpers, the hymn is Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. together not only to offer our worship to God but also to receive his forgiveness. So let us kneel or sit as we confess our sins to God 
and seek again the assurance of his grace towards us. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand. O Lord, open our lips. O God, make speed to save us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. We're going to praise him by saying the 100th Psalm, the Jubilate, which will also come up on the screen for you. O oh, shout to the Lord. O oh, shout to the Lord in triumph all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his face with songs of joy. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Come into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his holy name. For the Lord is good, his loving mercy is forever, his faithfulness throughout all generations. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Please take your seats. We're going to have our first reading, which William is going to come and read for us. Our reading is from 1 Corinthians, chapter 13, verses 1 to 13. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what, in, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're going to sing another song, and this one is picking up on that theme of love. It's called Let There Be Love Shared Among Us. And the words will come up again. We are going to, it's a very short song. We're going to sing it through twice. It's going to be on the screen. Let There Be Love Shared Among Us.
Please take your seats for our second reading. Our second reading is from Luke chapter 2, verses 22 to 40. Jesus presented in the temple. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a, be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, William, very much. It's lovely to get back to having different voices reading. And uh, thank you to one or two people who said that they were willing to do that. I'll be in touch with you, but we'd love to have more. It'd be great to have a variety of voices uh, sharing in our readings in church. Well, let's pray together as we look at this scripture. Heavenly Father, open our eyes and our hearts to receive and to believe and to follow your word through Christ our Lord. Amen. The year is flying in. It's uh, nearly the end of January. That gospel reading from Luke chapter 2 tells us that it's nearly 40 days since Christmas. Does it feel like that long since Christmas? I don't know. To me, it feels like it was a long time ago, and we've had no winter really since then, not yet anyway. Hopefully nothing too severe will come. We read there about the presentation of Jesus in the temples when his mother and father, Joseph and Mary, took the little child along to uh, the temple 40 days after his birth to dedicate him to God. And the prophets Anna and Simeon, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke about his future. But I want to focus this morning really on the other reading from 1 Corinthians Chapter 13, the passage that was all about love. And if anybody wants to see it in the church Bible in front of you, it's page 1154. Some of you, when that was being read, you might have been kind of looking around saying, who's getting married? Because it is a reading that's often read at weddings. And maybe it was read at yours, if you're married. But 
You know they say a dog is for life, it's not just for Christmas. Well, this Bible reading is not just for weddings. It's very suitable for when people are getting married because it's all about love. And uh, marriage without love is not so good. But this chapter is about more than that. This wonderful chapter in the Bible was written by St. Paul, not to a happy couple to launch them into married life. It was written to a church. It was written in a letter that was sent to the church in Corinth, a church that was very diverse and very energetic and very troubled. And it was written to train them to love and serve together as the people of God. So this was written also for us about how we can live in love as God's family. It's hugely challenging and it's wonderfully encouraging. It's like a gold mine, this chapter, one of the most beautiful parts of the Bible. And I'm only going to have time to pick out a couple of little tiny bits this morning. Just to go back, you remember how last week we talked about the body of Christ, um, and we saw that in chapter 12 of this, past, of this letter, St. Paul says that when uh, we come to faith in Christ, we become part of his body. So all of us belong to Jesus, and every one of us is important. So everybody here, everybody who belongs to our church, matters. And we've all been given gifts by the Holy Spirit to use uh, within the life of the church. And now Paul wants to tell us that we need to use those gifts in love. Just like the body is incomplete without the Spirit to give it life, so all of our activities and actions are incomplete if they're not done with love. So I think he wants to tell us that love is essential, also to tell us love is beautiful and that it's eternal. First thing is love is essential. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but don't have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. I should have brought our gong with me. We actually have a gong in the house, and sometimes we bong it with a big hammer. Bong, and um, it makes a big sound. But of course, um, if we are good at speaking and making noise, but we're not loving, then we're no more useful than a gong or a cymbal. We could have tremendous faith. We could have brilliant knowledge. We could be incredibly generous even, and we could serve for years and yet do it without love, Paul says. And if I do it without love, I am nothing. It's a very uh, striking thought, isn't it, that we could be highly talented, very active, we could be doing things that gain us people's thanks and applause, and yet we would be nothing if we do it without love. This requires us to stop and to think about whether our activity and our Christian service is being done out of a tired sense of duty or even out of promoting ourselves, or whether it's been done in love. In the, as you know, we still have online services, and hello to everybody who's watching us on the internet right now today, uh, if it's still working. I never really know, but it does seem to. We also have an online service on a Wednesday night, and we've been looking at the book of Revelation. And there's a place there in chapter 2 where Jesus addresses a church in Ephesus, and he says to them, I know that you work hard. I know that you're faithful. I know that you've been persevering and keeping going, but you have forsaken the love that you had at first. It is possible sometimes, isn't it, that we, that we go on doing the things that we do in life but actually our heart's not in it. 
and the love has kind of drained away and we're only a shadow of what we could be. What can we do if we get to that point? What can you do if you're aware that you don't have the love for God or for other people that we should have? Well, the same as what we do when we're thirsty, we ask for a drink. The same as what we do when we're hungry, we ask for food. What do we do if we're loveless? We ask for love. It says in the Bible, in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, God has poured his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So love is a gift from God. We don't need to make it inside ourselves. We don't have to just wait until it mysteriously comes. We can ask for it. One of the lovely collects in our book of common prayer uh, is one where we pray, um, how does it go? It goes, Lord, you have taught us that all our doings without love are nothing worth. Send your Holy Spirit and pour into our hearts that most excellent gift of love. And do you think if we ask God to give us more love, do you think he will answer? Yes, of course he will. Love is essential. We can ask for it. Love is beautiful. Here's the next part of the passage. It's the bit where he describes love. I wonder, can our operators go back a few slides into the reading and go back to, the, oh, it's the earlier one, so you've got to go back a few stages. Sorry, I didn't warn you about this. Stop there. Go forward. Verse 4. Go forward one. Yes. These are some of the loveliest words, aren't they? Love is patient. Love is kind. Does not envy, does not boast, is not proud. It's not, does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs and so on. It's a lovely description, isn't it? Many people have tried to capture in words what love is. I looked in my dictionary, and it said love is an intense feeling of deep affection or fondness for a person or thing. Well, that's that's part of it, isn't it? That's true enough. Not bad. Uh, I looked up on the internet some other descriptions of love. Here's an attempt by a television scientist called Jim Al-Khalili. Uh, He does some very good programs about physics and so on. But he said this about love. He says, love is a powerful neurological condition, like hunger or thirst, only more permanent. He says, in love, the brain releases a whole set of chemicals, pheromones, dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, oxytocin, and vasopressin. So there's another way of talking about love. What do you think, doctor? Is that a good description of love? There we are. Okay, well, um, but it's not altogether satisfying, is it? That's true that all those amazing things are happening in our brains. And so, um, you know, showing love to other people is actually good for you. Um, But I don't think all of that stuff would fit on the Valentine's card. Maybe we need to go to a poet. What poet was celebrated this past week? He has a special day on the 25th of January. Where's all the Scottish or Ulster Scots people? Yeah, go on. I heard it there somewhere. Robbie Burns, Robbie Burns, the great Scottish poet. He wrote, my love is like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. My love is like the melody that's sweetly played in tune. So fair art thou, my bonnie lass, so deep in love am I. And I will love thee still, my dear, till all the seas gone dry. I think I like that one better than the science one, but uh, still, back to the Bible, Paul here is not really trying to be, he's not trying to be scientific, and he's not trying to be sentimental like a poem, and he's not trying to give a dictionary definition. What he's doing here is he's just telling us in a very down-to-earth way, in a kind of very rugged and practical way, what love is. So love is patient and kind. And to me that means that it involves 
using our time well. Time is one of the most precious things we have, isn't it? And we don't have enough of it often. But we're patient if we have love. We're willing to sometimes stop doing the thing that we want to do to do the thing that somebody else needs. It doesn't envy or boast. It's not proud. Those are to do with the times when we, we put people in layers, don't we? And we, we, we put people from the, the important high up people and then the less important low down people. And we either are envious, that's where we're envious of the people who we think are above us, or we're boastful. We boast about, over the people who are, we think are down below us. But love puts everybody on the same level. It's not, it does not dishonor others, or to put it more simply, it's not rude. Love is not rude. It's a challenging one, isn't it? It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. I wonder, has the ups and downs of this last couple of years with the pandemic changed your anger levels? And how quickly you get annoyed. I think I'm preaching this to myself a wee bit anyway. Keeps no record of wrongs. Sometimes we, we kind of forgive, don't we? But then we just, we still keep the evidence of what people have done in case it might be needed some other time. But love is willing to forget as well as forgive. So it's a description of Jesus, isn't it? It's a description. It's a Christ-like description. You could put his name into all these things. Who do you know that is patient, kind, not self-serving, that's forgiving, who loves the truth and not evil, and so on? The great thing we need to do is to spend time with Jesus Christ in the Scriptures and in prayer that we would grow more like him. I want to encourage our young people, the children that are here today, do you know the great business of life is to become more like Jesus? The greatest thing you can do, let's make that our ambition. It's wonderful when we have ambitions, when we want to be a musician or a builder or a footballer, or we want to have our own business, or we want to help people by teaching or nursing, or we want to um, work on the farm, all these great things. But let's also have another ambition. Let's have it as our desire that we want to be like Jesus, filled with love. Love is essential. Love is beautiful. It's a beautiful description. And then finally of all, love is eternal. And I haven't got much time for that, uh, really. But love is, love is something that's going to last. And I think that's what the last part, just flick forward, Benjamin, to this bit here. Um, this is this bit where it talks about how so many things are going to disappear, aren't they? So many of the things that we think are really, really important now are not going to really matter in a thousand years' time. But love still will. And becoming like Jesus will. That's why St. Paul says here how we want to grow up to be more like Jesus. Okay. Wonderful chapter. We've only scratched the surface. Churches need to hear and grow in love. Churches can be known for many things. Some are known for their fabulous buildings, for their great music, for their tremendous fundraising efforts, for their outreach to the community. Some are marked by being very friendly. Some, unfortunately, have a reputation for being full of conflict. What's the greatest thing we could be known for? It's love. Let's be a church family where 1 Corinthians 13 is a reality more and more and where we're growing in Christian love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's go forward a few slides there, boys. We need the Apostles' Creed. That's what we need to find. Well done. With great efficiency. Let's stand to affirm our faith. I believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty 
Creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Let's begin with that lovely prayer which I mentioned. O Lord, you have taught us that all our doings without love are nothing worth. Send your Holy Spirit and pour into our hearts that most excellent gift of love, the very bond of peace and of all virtue, without which whoever lives is counted dead before you. Grant this for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And a collect for this Sunday, the fourth Sunday after Epiphany. Creator God, who in the beginning commanded the light to shine out of darkness, we pray that the light of the glorious gospel of Christ may dispel the darkness of ignorance and unbelief, shine into the hearts of all your people, and reveal the knowledge of your glory in the face of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our dear Heavenly Father, we pray for this world with all its difficulties and conflicts, your heart is broken as you see the war and uh, disagreement taking place across the world. We pray, Lord, for those places where there is ongoing conflict. We think of the places so often forgotten, like South Sudan, like conflict in Nigeria. We think of the situation in Afghanistan following the Western withdrawal there and so much hunger and hardship. And we also pray for the tensions between Russia and Ukraine and the West. And we ask, Lord, that through the wisdom and efforts of peacemaking, Lord, that these situations of conflict or potential conflict may be brought to peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Pray, Heavenly Father, for those who are serving you abroad. We remember our friends, the Crichtons. We remember Sarah. We remember, Lord, all who are working in mission or development or aid work around our world. We continue, Lord, also to pray for our own denomination, for the Church of Ireland. We pray, Lord, for Andrew, our bishop, for John, our archbishop, we pray for all the various parishes in our Diocese of Derry and Raffoe. We particularly remember those that are currently without a minister uh, leading them. We also pray, Lord, for our own parish, that you will cause us to use our gifts with love. In Jesus' name, amen. We pray for all who are sick or injured all who are going through times of difficulty, continue to remember Lorna Mahan and her husband and her family as she uh, appears to be making progress in her recovery from injury in a car accident. We pray, Lord, for all who are in hospital. Lord, we continue to remember Evelyn and Roland. We pray for all who are bereaved. And we think of Norman Ingram's friends and neighbors and family and all who miss him so much. And we thank you, Lord, for your presence with us. And as we begin a new week, so we ask that the peace of Christ and the love of Christ and the hope which come from Christ would so fill us that we would be enabled to walk faithfully and lovingly in these days. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's use the Lord's Prayer together, the words which Jesus taught us. Our Father, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. We're going to come to our last hymn. And this hymn is Take My Life and Let It Be Consecrated, Lord, to Thee. It's number 597. It's also on the screen. This particular uh, version of it, we, there's no singing on this one, so you've got to supply the singing. It's just the organ that you're going to hear now on this. So let's join together with enthusiasm and plenty of volume. Take my life and let it be. the Holy Trinity make you strong in faith and love, defend you on every side, and guide you in truth and peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and remain with you always. Amen.